So today we're going to finish up chapter 6. We're going to do the second part of that chapter, which is pages 211 to 226, and we will be discussing DNA repair and recombination. We'll start today's lecture just talking about mutations in general, get an overview of mutations so we understand what we mean by the term and why they need to be repaired. We'll go over the DNA mismatch repair system right after that, as well as some of the other repair systems that also exist, although we won't go into the others in as much detail. We'll talk about how double-strand breaks, the complete severing of DNA molecules, is repaired. And more specifically, we'll talk in depth about how the process of homologous recombination is used to repair these double-strand breaks. We'll end the lecture with a little bit of information on mobile genetic en elements, which are just um, very, very interesting and a little bit um, unsettling as well, to say the least. So let's start today by just reiterating some of the more important comments that we introduced at the beginning of the last lecture. We talked about the importance of mutations for evolution. Mutations certainly do drive the process of evolution. All of the life that exists on this planet exists because of mutations. Life is adaptable and can change with a dynamic environment because of mutations. And every living thing on this planet is different from everything else because of mutations. So mutations certainly are the driver of evolution. So it sounds to me like mutations are pretty good. Mutations also drive decline. All of the inherited diseases that are um, prevalent in humans are due to mutations. Any individual reduced fitness in any specific person can be traced back to mutations. So it sounds like mutations are bad. So what's exactly going on here? How does this work? Well, let's analogize it this way. So here's a picture of my house. Yeah, right. I wish this was my house, but let's assume for a moment that this is my house. And let's throw a brick at my house. So the brick is the mutation, and my house is the genome. So let's go ahead and do it. Throw a brick at my house. Now, is there a chance that this brick will hit my house in such a way as to elicit an improvement? Sure, you can imagine that perhaps there's some minor distortion on one of those pillars that the brick would knock off. Or maybe I'm not too happy with a discolored tile on the patio there and the brick hits that. So it's possible that the brick will improve my house when it strikes it. But it's much more likely that the brick is going to do some damage and hurt the house. This is how mutations work. Is it possible that the mutation will improve the individual? Sure, it's possible. It happens. Is it statistically likely? Not at all. Most mutations are going to be detrimental, and a very select few will help the individual. So, to survive and reproduce as a species and as individuals, we must all be genetically stable. All life on this planet must be genetically stable. What we mean by that is that mutations must be kept to a minimum if life is going to persist on this planet. Now, the way that mutations are kept to a minimum is through the super accurate, unbelievable process of DNA replication that we discussed in the last lecture. But also, when mistakes are made, they're fixed by DNA repair mechanisms, which we will be talking about today. So before we talk about fixing mutations, let's get a better handle on what mutations can actually do. There are a few mutations that slip through the cracks. These are mutations that, are, um, that become incorporated in a genome. They're not fixed by the proofreading mechanism of DNA polymerase that we talked about last time. And also, these same mutations are not fixed by DNA repair mechanisms that we'll talk about in just a second. The rate of these unfixed mutations that become um, stable in a genome is about one in every billion nucleotides that are replicated. Uh, that's an amazing number of fidelity. Uh, that's just an amazing accuracy that we have in copying genomes. But we do have mutations occur and become stable uh, and permanent in the genome, one in every billion nucleotides replicated. Now again, most of these mutations are bad, just like most of the brick strikes against my beautiful home there will be detrimental. But yes, some very small percentage, some small select few of those mutations will benefit the individual, make that individual more fit, make that individual procreate more, and drive evolution in a positive direction such as the nature of life. Most of it is going to be bad, and very little of it will be good. But the good is what changes life on this planet. Any permanent change in a DNA sequence, whether it is good or bad, detrimental or positive, is a mutation by definition. 
Even a mutation that affects only a single base of DNA, so even only the single change of one base of DNA in an entire genome can have a very profound effect, and that profound effect could be positive or negative if that mutation occurs in a vital region of DNA. So what do we mean by vital region? Well, any region of DNA that encodes a protein is a vital region. So any change in a DNA sequence that radically changes the amino acid sequence of a protein will have a profound consequence. Most of the time the protein will not work as well and that's a negative effect. Sometimes the protein will be improved and that's a positive effect. But please always in the back of your mind keep in mind the central dogma. DNA exists solely to contain the information for building proteins. So if we're changing the protein building information we're changing the individual. It is the proteins that do everything and DNA simply serves as the instruction manual for building those proteins. So let's use an example from human beings to drive home the point that uh, most mutations can be bad. Everyone I hope knows what hemoglobin is. Hemoglobin is the protein in red blood cells that carries oxygen around the body. This is a short sequence from the large hemoglobin gene and we see a single mutation. This mutation is a base substitution. The A on the top strand is the normal sequence for hemoglobin and it mutates to a T which we see on the bottom strand, a single base substitution, an A for T swap. We've switched adenine to thymine. What's the effect of this mutation? Sickle cell anemia. This single change in the DNA sequence of this hemoglobin gene changes red blood cells that are normal to sickle celled red blood cells. This one DNA sequence change, this mutation, because it is permanent, alters the hemoglobin protein enough that it can no longer efficiently carry oxygen, it distorts the overall shape of the red blood cell, and it results in a very severe form of anemia. Anemia is fairly common, but the side effects of this disease are faintness, shortness of breath, weakness, easily fatigued. It could be a quite a debilitating disease. The effect on the individual is huge. The cause of that disease? A single base substitution in a critical spot that changes a protein. People who have sickle cell anemia, they contain this mutation, this A for T swap, in every single one of their cells because their genome is present in every single one of their cells. So even cells that aren't making hemoglobin contain the mutation. This is because individuals with sickle cell anemia inherited that disease. A person with sickle cell anemia received a mutant hemoglobin gene from their mother as well as their father when their egg was fertilized to create them. So there's not a single cell in the body of a, hemo of, in the body of a sickle cell anemia patient that knows or has the information for making a normal hemoglobin protein. For those of you who remember your genetics material, these individuals are homozygotic recessive. They contain two mutant alleles. So this inherited sickle cell anemia condition, this is due to a germline mutation. A germline mutation is a mutation that occurs in the gamete, and that mutation is passed on and inherited by the next generation. What makes germline mutations unique is that the mutant individual themselves is usually asymptomatic. Think of it this way. So I'm a father, I have two kids, and obviously I used gametes to make those kids. My gametes do not affect my physiology at all. They are simply genetic packages that I donate to my next generation. So if I have a mutation in one of my gametes, I am the mutant individual. The mutation occurred in me. But what's the effect on me? There is none, because my gametes do not contribute to my overall physiology or health. However, if I pass that mutant gamete on to the next generation, to one of my children, they have that information in every single one of their cells because every single one of their cells derived from the single fertilized egg that I helped create. And so germline mutations don't affect the individual who picked up the mutation. Germline mutations affect their offspring. This is in contrast to the other class of mutations which are somatic mutations. Somatic mutations occur in somatic cells and somatic cells are all the cells in your body that aren't gametes. 
Somatic mutations give rise to mutant clusters of cells in the mutant individual themselves. So this time, the person who obtained the mutation shows effects from that mutation. Here's a perfect example of a somatic mutation. Uh, in the background is actually the mother dog, and in the foreground we see the puppy, although this dog is fairly mature. The black or brown fur on this dog's face is due to a somatic mutation that occurred in this younger dog. One skin cell on the face of this animal mutated, started producing brown fur as a result, and every other cell that was born of that initial mutant cell also contained the information for making brown fur. And so this patch of brown fur represents a patch or cluster of mutant cells on the face of this dog due to a single somatic mutation. If this same mutation occurred in the gametes of the mother dog, she would remain unaffected. But the puppy from that mutation would be all brown because this dog arose from a single cell. And if that single cell was mutated for brown fur, every single cell in this dog would carry that mutation. And so every single cell in this dog would show that mutant effect. A very striking difference between somatic and germline mutations. Germline mutations affect the next generation in full. Somatic mutations affect that individual in part. This diagram also shows that effect. Here we have a fish, and this fish can pick up one of the two different types of mutations. If the fish picks up a somatic mutation, that very fish that obtained the mutant will show a patch or cluster of mutant cells on itself. However, if that very same fish picks up a germline mutation, that fish itself will be unaffected. However, after it reproduces, some of its offspring fish will be completely affected with that mutation because it was in the germ cells, the gametes. So cancer, which is the result of mutation that many people obviously are interested in for um, different reasons, cancer is the result of somatic mutations accumulating in the individual over time. These are mutations that occur in non-gamete cells in the individual. They give rise to a cluster of mutant cells, and that individual who obtained the mutations obviously shows the effects. So whether we're talking about germline mutations or somatic mutations, I hope you see that it's critically important for all cells, regardless of what type of cell they are, to maintain the fidelity or the accuracy of their DNA sequences. So it's a hard world out there for DNA. Cells want to keep their DNA accurate, mutation-free, but DNA is constantly suffering damage in the context of cells. Now there are spontaneous mutations that occur because of mistakes made by the DNA replication machinery. They're rare, but they happen. But on top of that, cells live in a brutal environment. And we all live in a world that's surrounded by natural carcinogens, man-made carcinogens. These are mutagens which damage DNA every single day. I'd like you to take a moment just to count to five in five full seconds. That'd be one Mississippi, two Mississippi, all the way to five. Now in the time it took you to do that, one trillion of your purines in your body spontaneously snapped off their nucleotides, resulting in mutations. Every five seconds, a trillion of your DNA bases undergo spontaneous mutation. Isn't that amazing? Now keep in mind, that's a very small percentage of your DNA. Each one of your cells has 3.2 billion bases, and every human being is made up on average of about 50 trillion cells. So that's a lot of DNA you're carrying around with you. One trillion of those bases is a very small percent, but still a very large number. So I challenge you to try sleeping soundly tonight, thinking that with each passing five seconds, another trillion of your bases has become mutated. This particular type of mutation, where a base, typically a purine, spontaneously snaps off its nucleotide, is called depurination. And it results in a missing base, obviously, called an apurinic site, or an AP site. So here's a schematic of what happens. On the right, we see a normal sequence with a TA base pair. However, we can have a spontaneous deamination. In this case, it's a pyrimidine that was lost, but it can happen with purines as well. And that missing base creates an AP site. Now see, the phosphate sugar backbone itself is left intact. 
We have no break in the backbone of DNA. It's simply the base that's been lost. The book analogizes this to a missing tooth, right? The, the jaw and the gums are fine. It's just the tooth that's missing. This type of mutation is fixed by a DNA repair mechanism called base excision repair, which we'll cover in just a second. But keep in mind, when you count it to five and one trillion of your bases popped off their DNA backbone, they're not left off. There are all these scavenger proteins there that rush in and see that those mistakes and fix them right in real time. And we'll talk about those fixes in just a second. Another type of spontaneous mutation that occurs all the time in our DNA is a deamination. Deamination is the loss of an amino group from a DNA base. And typically this happens to cytosine. Here we see cytosine as part of its nucleotide. Again, the ribose, sugar, and a single phosphate here. This is the amino group on cytosine up here, this nitrogen group. This nitrogen group, this amino group, can be spontaneously lost and replaced with an oxygen from water. It happens by itself. It's a chemical process. The thing that makes that a little bit detrimental is cytosine with no amino group is uracil. And what's the importance of that? Well, uracil is the RNA equivalent of thymine. So cells recognize this uracil as a thymine. What this actually creates is a C to T base substitution. So this can result in a true fixed mutation if it's not recognized properly and fixed properly by the cell. So deamination and depurination are things that occur spontaneously in cells. There's really no avoiding it. It's not triggered by an environmental effect. These are just chemical breakdowns that happen naturally. But there are also environmental triggers to, to uh, mutations, of course. One of the most prevalent and hardest to avoid is UV light. So in the spectrum of sunlight, there is UV light as well. And UV light is a very high energy light, and it causes neighboring pyrimidines. Now, pyrimidines are the cytosines and thymines to become covalently bound to one another. Usually this happens to thymines alone, and so these mutations are called thymine dimers, and they look like this. Here we have two unmutated thymines in a row on one strand of DNA sitting next to each other, TT. And if hit in the right way with UV radiation, these two thymines become covalently bound to one another. Covalent bonds form between the thymine bases themselves. These thymine dimers are a problem. They distort the backbone of DNA. They, re they destroy the regular repeating uh, pattern of DNA. <clears throat> but they also stall replication forks. They lead to genome damage. They lead to something called double-stranded breaks during replication. And thymine dimers are a major contributing cause of skin cancer. So any of these mutations, whether they're environmentally induced or spontaneous in the cell, any of these mutations, if they're left unrepaired, could potentially lead to very catastrophic events if they occur, again, in important sequences of DNA that are needed to express the proper proteins. Cells don't have a mechanism by which to survey the genome and say, well, you know, this mutation occurred in a non-critical region, so we'll come back to it later. Whereas this mutation over here is in a very important gene, so we need to fix it right now. Cells can't do that. Cells can't recognize important DNA from non-important DNA. So cells do the only thing they can do. They attempt to repair all mutations in real time as quickly as possible. So let's talk now about how DNA is repaired. The first repair mechanism we'll talk about is called DNA mismatch repair. And the DNA mismatch repair system is dedicated exclusively to finding those mistakes that are performed by DNA polymerase they have somehow escaped through the proofreading mechanism of DNA polymerase during replication, and so they need to be fixed. So DNA mismatch is dedicated to fixing DNA polymerase's mistakes. As its name suggests, what this mechanism repairs are bases that aren't correctly paired with one another, and, and that are, that those are the mistakes that DNA polymerase causes. You might remember from the last lecture, we said that the error rate of DNA polymerase itself, even with its proofreading, is about one mistake in every 10 million bases it synthesizes. That's astounding. That's a hugely accurate rate. However, we also said, I think two lectures ago, that the overall error rate when a genome is copied in humans is about one in a billion. So there's about two mis mistakes that become fixed uh, as one cell divides into two, and our genome is about 3.2 billion bases long. So how is it that DNA polymerase makes one in 10 million mistakes, but the overall error rate is one in a billion? It's because of mismatch repair. 
Mismatch Repair is responsible for a hundredfold improvement in the error rate of DNA polymerase. DNA Mismatch Repair repairs about 99% of the mistakes that are made by DNA polymerase. So let's compare this accuracy rate with some other real-world um, situations that we might be familiar with. Well, the U.S. Post Office has a 13% error rate, about 13 late deliveries per 100 parcels. The um, United States Airlines system has about a 0.5% error rate. They have one lost bag per 200 items of luggage. A professional typist typing at 120 words per minute makes about one mistake every 250 characters. That's pretty impressive, uh, but not nearly as impressive as DNA polymerase. And even driving a car in the United States is about one death per uh, 10,000 people per year. Now compare that to DNA polymerase without mismatch repair. One mistake in 10 million. DNA mismatch, DNA replication with mismatch repair, one mistake in a billion. Just amazing. So please appreciate how hard and the lengths that the cell goes to to minimize mutations. And why? Why does it do that? Because mutations are largely detrimental. Because the vast majority of bricks thrown at my house will damage my house, and the vast majority of mutations uh, picked up by a genome will hurt the individual. All right, so you're a cell. You know mistakes are out there. You know that they should be fixed. And the first question becomes, well, how are you going to recognize that there's a mistake at all? Well, the DNA mismatch repair system recognizes mistakes the very same way DNA polymerase itself does, by distortions in the backbone of DNA, by a disruption of that nice, regular, repeating pattern of the DNA backbone. So if there's a section of newly made DNA, the part that contains the mismatch is simply cut out and the old, non-mutated strand is used as template to fix the error and get it right next time. But hold on a second. We've got two strands of DNA. How in the world does the cell know which one is right? Consider this. DNA polymerase has made a mistake that has snuck through proofreading. We have a GA mismatch. Something's wrong. Definitely. There's a distortion in the backbone of DNA. Fine. DNA mismatch repair knows that something needs to be fixed. But which of these two strands is the old one with the right sequence? And which is the new one with the wrong sequence? What should we fix this to? GC or AT? If we leave it alone and we don't do anything, we'll have a second round of replication. And across from the G, we will put a C. And across from the A, we will put a T. Now, one of these two new molecules is correct, but the other one is not. Once this happens, once the next round of replication is allowed to occur, that is a fixed mutation. That mutation is unfixable. The cell will never recognize it as wrong again. So we have two issues here. We need to, one, recognize which of these two strands is the right strand with the correct sequence, the older strand. And we have to do the repair before the next round of replication comes through, because if we don't fix it soon, it's going to get locked in place and it'll never be fixable again. So the way bacterial cells do this is they actually use DNA methylation to mark old, correct DNA. All we mean when we say DNA methylation is that single bases, in this case we're showing adenine, but a cytosine can also be methylated, single bases have a very small methyl group, a CH3 group, added somewhere onto them. It's just a little tag. It doesn't interfere with the base itself. It doesn't change the information the base is holding. It's just a tiny little tag, like a marker or a flag, that is recognized by the cell. So bacterial cells methylate their DNA. What makes this work is that the methylation kind of lags in time behind replication. So old DNA is methylated, but newly synthesized DNA is not. So let's see that in this figure. Here we have an old double-stranded molecule of DNA, and so the adenines on both strands are methylated. We're going to have a round of replication come through this region. So we separate these two strands, and we use each as template. Here we see the top strand being used as template here, and the bottom strand being used as template here. Once replication is finished, we have two molecules that look like this. They are called hemimethylated. They have one methylated strand, which served as the template, 
and one unmethylated strand, which is unmethylated simply because it's brand new, which is on the bottom here. Well, it's easy to see which is the old strand and which is the new strand now, isn't it? The old strand is the methylated strand, and the new strand is unmethylated. If we had a mismatch error occur during replication, the old strand has the right sequence, and the new strand, which is unmethylated, has the mutant sequence. So when there's a mismatch, the cell simply fixes the unmethylated strand so that it matches the new, the, I'm sorry, the old methylated strand. Once the repair is complete, and there are no more distortions, and all the DNA looks good, the new strand is methylated so that it is trustworthy, marked as old, and you can count on the sequence on both of these strands to be accurate. And when the next round of replication occurs, we'll go back to a hemimethylated state. And if there are any errors there, we'll fix the unmethylated strand so that it matches the methylated strand, because the unmethylated strand is new and the methylated strand is old. And once all the repairs have been made, we'll methylate them both. They can both be trusted. It's a beautiful system. So here's how DNA mismatch works in total. Here we have a, a large diagram showing everything. We have the methylation on the old strand. The old strand is in green, and here's the little methyl group in red, this little red flag. And we have a distortion, a mismatch in the backbone here. So in this case, it's a GT uh, mismatch. Same problem. Which is the right one, the G or the T? Which do we fix, the G or the T? Well, it's not a problem at all. The old strand is the green strand because it has the methyl group. The T is right, and the G is wrong. So we need to change this G to an A. What the cell does is it actually nicks the backbone of DNA right next to the methylated sequence. It starts there. So we create a, a break in the backbone of the DNA. And it just chews up all the DNA. Why try to be precise here? Just chew it all up. So it chews and chews and chews and removes all the new DNA all the way to the distortion. So all that DNA is gone up to the error. And then it tries again. Repair DNA polymerase comes in and makes new DNA, starting where we left off at the methylated sequence and going all the way to the end, to the distortion. There's going to be a break in the backbone there. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, and we can seal that up with DNA ligase. But the point is that we've repaired the mistake. We have a proper base pair here that's TA, no more mismatch, and we know it's the right sequence because we have fixed the new strand to match the old methylated strand. Now, eukaryotes like us, we don't methylate DNA in this way. We methylate DNA, but for completely different reasons. We actually, to this day, still have no idea whatsoever how our cells tell new strands from old strands. They're not doing it through methylation. Certainly they do it because mismatch repair occurs in our cells and it always occurs correctly. So cells know which strand is right and which strand is wrong. Cells know which strand is old and which strand is new. We just have no idea how they know it. So again, this is the mismatch repair system. I'm going to stray from the textbook quite a bit now and go over some of the other more common repair systems that are out there. But just before we do that, keep in mind that mismatch repair is our best defense over incorporating errors that are made by DNA polymerase. That means it's our best defense against somatic mutations, which can lead to cancer. In fact, when we hear about people having predispositions to cancer, they have a genetic predisposition for cancer, what we really mean is that we have an inherited defect in DNA repair. Most of the genetic predispositions to cancer are due to inheriting mutations from one of our parents in a gene that's responsible for encoding a protein that's part of DNA mismatch repair. So imagine you inherit one mutant allele for a DNA repair protein from your mother. And I hope everyone remembers what an allele is from genetics. So you have one mutant allele from your mother for a mutant version of a DNA repair protein. But the allele you inherited from your father for that very same gene is wild type. It's fine. Well, you're fine. You're heterozygote, but you have one good allele. That means you can make a working repair enzyme. That means DNA mismatch repair works fine in you. So you live your life. You are involved in the environment, actually, obviously. But then at some point, you're sun worshipping, you're outside getting a nice tan, and particular UV light wave, hits two thymines, locks them together into a thymine dimer, right in your good allele 
for your DNA repair protein, which you had inherited from your father. Well, now what? Well, now in that single cell that received that mutation, there is no functioning DNA repair enzyme. There's no longer a mismatch repair system. So in that one cell, further mutations that occur will accumulate, and they won't be fixed. Now, this is a skin cell, so it divides often. When that cell divides, it passes the mutant version of the DNA repair alleles to all of its daughter cells. And all of those daughter cells will accumulate mutations at a much higher rate because they have no mismatch repair. And what's going to happen eventually? Well, one of those cells is going to pick up a secondary mutation in another gene which is going to promote cancer. And as soon as one of those cells with a defective DNA mismatch repair system begins dividing and proliferating excessively, you will have skin cancer form. And so this is the predisposition. The predisposition is that you started life with only one functioning DNA repair mechanism, DNA repair enzyme. And you lived all your life counting on that one. You had no backup. So when that allele becomes mutated in any one of your cells, that mutant cell now has no DNA repair uh, no DNA mismatch repair system functioning, and it is much more prone to accumulate the wrong types of mutations and develop into a cancer cell. Now, is this the cause of all cancers? Absolutely not. But this is the underlying mechanism of a predisposition for certain cancers. All right, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about a second DNA repair mechanism called base excision repair. Here, instead of chewing up a very large segment of DNA to repair a single mismatch, only the single mutant damaged base is recognized and cut out of the DNA. So it's a little bit more of a precise mechanism. So only the offending mutant base is removed. Once that base is removed, we're actually left with an apurinic site. If you remember, when we remove a base and only the base, we have an AP site left behind. That AP site is then cut to remove the entire nucleotide from the mutant sequence. We have a gap in the backbone of DNA. That single nucleotide gap is then filled in by a DNA polymerase, which adds the correct nucleotide, and DNA ligase seals the NIC. So that's shown in this series of figures here. Here we have a damaged base. The very first thing that happens is just the base is removed. The backbone is left intact, and the result of that is an apurinic site. The apurinic site is recognized by other DNA repair enzymes that cut on either side of that one nucleotide, removing the nucleotide completely. This creates a gap in the DNA backbone. This gap is filled in with an entirely new nucleotide to take the place of the mutant one. That nucleotide is good. It repairs the error. But the last thing we have is a gap or a, a nick in the backbone of DNA, and that nick is sealed by DNA ligase which makes a new phosphodiester bond, just as it did in DNA replication. The final repair mechanism we'll discuss today is nucleotide excision repair. This is a system that repairs damage that's caused by major mutations, multiple mutations in a single DNA strand that lead to major distortions in the structure of DNA. Actually, thymine dimers are also fixed by nucleotide excision repair, but thymine dimers can be fixed another way too, which we'll talk about in a second. But any major damage in a localized region is going to be fixed by this mechanism. Nucleotide excision repair fixes, or can fix, most types of DNA damage. It's actually a very versatile system. And so oftentimes, if there is a mutation in another pathway, nucleotide excision repair can pick up some of the slack, at least. This repair mechanism has been around in life since the very beginning. Uh, we find nucleotide excision repair even in bacteria, and this, the process is homologous to how it occurs in us. So this is an ancient DNA repair mechanism. This repair is a multi-step process. The very first thing that happens is the scanning. We find the DNA damage by looking for distortions in the regular repeating pattern of DNA. When that distortion is found, the two strands of DNA in that offending region are separated, and they're kept separate by a modified version of single-stranded binding protein. So you've pulled the two strands apart. The DNA on the mutant offending strand is severed, and we can recognize that DNA because these mutations are so gross. They are, they are not incorporation errors. Remember, mismatch repair is dedicated exclusively for DNA replication errors. These are big, bad mutations. These are 
big chemical changes to DNA that just are wrong. It's very easy to see which is the mutant base and which is the wild type base because of, of the nature of the mutations. So the mutant DNA is severed on either side of the damage, leaving a large gap in the DNA. And then this gap is filled in by DNA repair polymerase. The new DNA is sealed into place by ligase, as we've talked about before, and we can see that in this schematic. Here we have some damage on the DNA, creating a distortion. Multiple proteins come in, they recognize that distortion, and they pull the two uh, sequences apart. We can see the single-stranded binding protein coming in here to keep those strands apart. We then have nicking on either side of the damage. So the, the single DNA strand is nicked on the damaged strand, and that whole offending mutant piece of DNA is taken away. DNA polymerase comes in, puts new DNA down that's not mutated. DNA ligase comes in and seals it in. DNA ligase is pretty much a molecular welder. It, it seals the joints of the DNA, keeping it at one contiguous constant molecule. And then we've fixed the mutation. The mutation has been fixed. So you can think of nucleotide excision repair to be very similar to base excision repair, except base excision removes a single base, whereas nucleotide excision repair removes a whole stretch of DNA. All right, so we have all of these repair mechanisms, and they are there, they exist to repair the vast majority of all of these different mutations that can occur in our cells. Again, these are mutations that occur on a very constant basis due to spontaneous chemical changes as well as environmentally induced damage. All of these repair mechanisms rely on double-stranded DNA to function. When you have a double-stranded molecule and one strand is mutant, that means you have a trustworthy strand with the correct information, and you have a mutant strand with the error. You can always use the trustworthy strand to fix the mutant strand because of the rules of base pairing. So, if we have a mutant strand of DNA, we know that all A's should be base paired with T's, and all C's should be base paired with G's. And so we simply identify the mutant strand, and we fix it, using the other strand as a guide. So each single strand of DNA actually serves as a redundant backup copy of the other, which is another beautiful kind of uh, consequence of the molecular structure of DNA. The other thing these repair mechanisms use, or exploit even, is that nice, regular, repeating, uniform structure of DNA. It should be said that none of these scanning enzymes that recognize errors are actually looking at the bases themselves. There's no scanning of the base sequence. It's all done by blind touch. The DNA should be very regular and repeating, and any change in that repeating structure is due to an error in the DNA. And that's how the damage is recognized. So before we move on, let's kind of summarize all of these repair mechanisms because they share so much more in common than they have differences. The very first thing that any repair mechanism does is recognize the damage, and the damage is recognized by distortions in the DNA. Then, somehow, the damage is removed, and this is where the mechanisms differ. So all of the mechanisms we just discussed differ most in how they remove the damage to DNA. But most of them use some type of DNA nuclease enzyme. A DNA nuclease is any type of DNA cutting enzyme. Any enzyme that cuts DNA in any way is referred to as a nuclease. Once the offending DNA has been removed, it is replaced with freshly synthesized DNA. And presumably, that DNA is error-free. Almost all of the time, this new DNA is made by the repair polymerase. This is the same DNA polymerase that replaced our RNA primers with DNA in the last lecture. So a lot of these enzymes do uh, double duty or triple duty. A lot of these enzymes are involved in different pathways, but they do the same thing. So just as the repair polymerase removes the uh, RNA primers during replication, the repair polymerase also puts down fresh DNA uh, when offending mutant DNA has been removed. These repair polymerases, like all other DNA polymerases, can only make DNA 5' prime to 3', prime, and they do have their own proofreading activity, so most of the time the DNA they put down can be trusted. Once that DNA has been synthesized, the mutant DNA has been replaced, we are always, always left with a nick in the DNA backbone, regardless of what mechanism we're discussing, and that nick is always sealed by DNA ligase, which restores the phosphate sugar backbone, uh, seals the break in that backbone, 
and creates a new phosphodiester bond. So cells go to enormous extremes to repair DNA. Even yeast, the simplest single-celled eukaryotic model organism that we have to work with, even yeast has over 50 different DNA repair enzymes. Humans have many, many, many more than that. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative for not fixing DNA is being bombarded with mutations, most of which are going to be detrimental. Any cell that cannot repair its DNA can't survive. It's just that simple. And so there's no choice. Cells have no choice. They have to have these repair mechanisms in place. Showing again the kind of the effect of mutations, even r mutations that are pretty isolated and specific, humans have a rare inherited mutation where only the repair mechanism that is exclusively for fixing thymine dimers is compromised. We talked about base excision repair being used to, I'm sorry, nucleotide excision repair being used to fix thymine dimers, and, and certainly that mechanism can fix thymine dimers, but there's another repair mechanism that also exists that's specifically for thymine dimers. It's actually a single enzyme called photolyase. Photolyase is powered by energy from the sun, and it goes around and it just cuts the covalent bonds that are holding two thymines together, so it's a, a simple reversal. Uh, the fact that it's powered by the sun is actually quite interesting. Remember, thymine dimers form as a result of UV light. So the idea here is that the enzyme that fixes the UV light-induced mutation is itself powered by sunlight. So when is the enzyme active? When you're in the sun. When are you having thymine dimers form? When you're in the sun. So photolyase just simply snips the covalent bonds that are holding thymines together, and then they go back to being independent thymines, and there is no mutation. Humans have a rare inherited mutation in photolyase, so that repair mechanism is no longer functioning. These individuals still have nucleotide excision repair working. So this is a very specific mutation that affects only this specific mechanism for repairing thymine dimers. What's the result of this mutation? Xeroderma pigmentosum, which you may have heard of before. Individuals with xeroderma pigmentosum are extremely sensitive to sunlight. This is one of the uh, easy to look at photographs that I could find online of an individual with xeroderma pigmentosum. You usually don't actually live to adulthood with this disorder. Uh, you, you are so racked with DNA damage and skin that skin cancer becomes a very, very real issue very early in life. This is a young child and, and you can see that she's got skin that appears to be very old, full of liver spots, and that's due to all of the DNA damage that occurs solely from the sun. So individuals with xeroderma pigmentosum have severe skin lesions, they have a hugely increased rate of skin cancer, and they must avoid sunlight at all costs. In fact, they make special hoods for kids with this disorder. This is a blackout hood, so it shields the body from sunlight, and that face shield that you see her wearing is um, UV-coated, UV-protectant, so the UV light from the sun actually doesn't hit her skin. Um, so why do individuals with this disorder have these symptoms? Solely because of a dysfunctional photolyase. They actually still even have nucleotide excision, I'm sorry, base excision repair, but they can't repair their DNA quick enough using only that mechanism. See, photolyase is very quick, very efficient. And so when photolyase is no longer functional, you can't keep up with the thymine dimers, can't keep up with that DNA damage. And so you have these effects as a result. It's almost like the water is coming into the ship faster than you can bucket it out again. And so you accumulate DNA mutations. This serves as a pretty striking example of the overall risks of mutations, and it also serves to show us just how effective our cells are at keeping up with the environmental mutations that we, that we encounter every day. All right, so those are all single DNA sequence mutations that we've talked about, but there's another whole class of mutations that are quite detrimental called double-strand breaks. Now, double-strand breaks can be fixed in two different mechanisms. One is non-homologous recombination, and the other is homologous recombination, and we'll talk about both now. So double-strand breaks in DNA is the complete severing of a DNA molecule into two pieces. As the name suggests, both strands of the DNA molecule are cut in the same place, and so one DNA molecule is cut into two. 
This is a very dramatic and potentially life-ending mutation for a cell. So certainly it's not fatal for an individual if they pick up a double-strand break in one of their cells, but very often a cell that uh, encounters a double-strand break will die. Because the DNA is cut in half, we can't rely on what we've been relying on so far. Every single DNA repair mechanism I've taught, told you about so far has used the good strand to fix the bad. But if you have a double strand break, there is no good intact strand to use. Both strands have been cut. It's a double strand break. So ionizing radiation can cause these. Mistakes that occur at the replication fork, free radicals, which you may have heard of, uh, can cause double strand breaks. And the cells have no choice but to fix them. So cells have two mechanisms, as I said uh, when I introduced this slide. The first is very elegant, very thorough. That's the homologous recombination mechanism. But homologous recombination is not only always possible for reasons that we'll get to in just a second. The other is the non-homologous recombination mechanism. It's very, very quick and dirty. It's a brute force technique. It actually leads to its own other kinds of mutations. But it's more commonly used because it's always available. And why do cells do such a quick and dirty fix? Well, what's the alternative? The alternative is the cell dies. So if you've got a quick and dirty mechanism or cell death, you go with the quick and dirty mechanism. Non-homologous recombination is pretty simple to understand. It simply takes the two broken ends of the DNA molecule, molecularly files them down to make them blunt, and then glues them back together again, or ligates them back together is the scientific term. So this figure from your textbook shows that. You have a double-strand break resulting in single-stranded overhangs here. Well, you can't glue those together necessarily. So those two overhangs are filed down, giving you two blunt ends of DNA, and then you just take those two ends and pop them back together again. Shown in slightly more detail here, again, we have a double-strand break. It is recognized by specific proteins that are needed for non-homologous recombination. You can see that the single strands have been chewed back, again giving us our blunt ends, and then those two blunt ends are rejoined together with DNA ligase, giving you one constant DNA molecule again. So did we fix the double strand break? Yeah, there's no double strand break anymore, but we had to chop nucleotides away in order to do that. When we blunted those two DNA ends, we lost all of those nucleotides that were giving us the overhangs. If this is done in an intergenic region that has no protein coding genes in it, of which the human genome has tons, then this is okay. Better to get this done right away and not have any long-term consequences to the cell <clears throat> than wait around for a better mechanism where the cell might die before we are able to do that. So this quick and dirty technique is fine if you are not disrupting protein coding genes. But if the double strand break occurs in a gene, in the middle of a gene, and even more so if that gene is critical and important for a cellular process, then non-homologous recombination is almost always going to result in that gene becoming inactive, in the protein made from that gene having no function, and so that is a loss of function mutation. That's going to be a problem. And remember, the cell has no mechanism whatsoever to be able to tell what is an important sequence of DNA versus what is an unneeded sequence of DNA. And so, if you go with non-homologous recombination, you just hope that you're not going to result in the loss of any important genes. Homologous recombination is much more elegant and fixes double-strand breaks much more effectively. But the catch is to do homologous recombination, you need a nearby DNA molecule, which is extremely similar, that's the homologous part, extremely similar in its DNA sequence to the strand that has the double strand break, to the DNA molecule that has the double strand break. So this is the catch, right? Uh, this is a very elegant fix, but you need to have a very similar DNA molecule nearby. That's not always possible. If you don't have a nearly similar, nearly identical DNA molecule nearby that you can mooch off of, then you've got to go with non-homologous end joining. But if you have a similar molecule, a homologous molecule, you can use homologous recombination. I do want to kind of point out and keep, keep in your mind that when we say a homologous molecule, we don't mean the other strand of a DNA molecule. We mean an entirely different double-stranded DNA molecule that has a very similar sequence. So what kind of homologous molecules do we have? Well, actually, we have homologous DNA molecules for every single chromosome in our cells. 
Remember, we are made up of 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. The chromosome we got from our mother versus the chromosome we got from our father is very, very similar. Not identical, but extremely similar. So one member of a homologous pair can always serve as the donor for the other member for homologous recombination. The only problem, again, is that the two homologous chromosomes for a single pair aren't always necessarily near each other in the nucleus, and so this repair mechanism is not always possible. The way that homologous recombination works is that the information, the DNA sequence on the nearby and similar DNA molecule, serves as the template in this case. To do repair, we need a template molecule of DNA whose sequence we can trust. If we have a double strand break, there is none in that one damaged DNA molecule, so we have to go to the homologous molecule in order to get that template strand. Is it identical? No. But it's close enough, and it's better than non-homologous end joining, and it's better than cell death. So the way that homologous recombination begins is that a nuclease recognizes the double strand break but instead of creating a blunt end, it actually chews the overhang back even more, creating a longer stretch of single-stranded DNA, as shown here. This free, somewhat long, single-stranded, broken end of DNA then probes and samples the nearby DNA molecule for a similarity in sequence. If the sequences between the damaged and intact molecules are similar, then they will base pair, and strand invasion will occur, as shown here. Strand invasion is when the single-stranded broken DNA molecule actually displaces one of the two strands in the intact molecule and base pairs with it itself. This creates what's called a branch point. A branch point is when the two DNA strands, one from each molecule, actually cross one another. And this whole structure, as seen here, is called a D-loop because it represents a D on its side. It's a looping of DNA like a D that's fallen over. The invading strand here can be elongated by the repair polymerase using this strand, the blue strand, as a guide for sequence. So now we're going to revert to the figure from your textbook. Again, just to get our bearings, we have a double strand break. It occurred near a homologous chromosome. The nuclease is going to chew back some of that strand, giving us a nice, long, single-stranded, broken DNA molecule. And then strand invasion will be the base pairing of that single-stranded broken molecule with the homologous sequences on the neighboring DNA molecule. So this is where we left off on the last slide, strand invasion. The next thing that happens, we said, is that DNA polymerase extends new DNA on this broken strand using the bottom strand, this template. So as this DNA is synthesized, we have to move the branch point over. The branch point moves or migrates almost like a replication fork would to allow additional single-stranded DNA to be opened up here in the D-loop, serving as template for the new DNA that's being made. What opens up this D-loop and moves the branch forward? DNA helicase, the very same enzyme that pushes the replication fork forward in DNA replication. Another example of an enzyme doing double duty. When all of this is done, and DNA has been synthesized past that break, now we have homology with the other end of the broken molecule, so we can join with that there. The only thing left is to separate these two entangled DNA molecules, and that's done by nicking the invading strands, breaking the phosphate sugar backbone, allowing those strands to return back to their normal uh, positions, and then sealing those nicks with DNA ligase. When that's completed, we have two finished, completely intact DNA molecules with no double-strand breaks and, more importantly, with no lost nucleotides. So if this type of mutation occurs in a protein-coding gene and we have homologous recombination occur, that protein-coding gene will not be rendered inactive. Homologous recombination is the most efficient and most versatile repair strategy available. The only problem is you need a homologous sequence nearby to carry it out. You might remember, or if you review the last lecture, you will certainly see that I talked very briefly about recombination in the intro slide. And what I said is that recombination is a way for a cell to throw away a complete segment of DNA that is far too mutated to repair and start from scratch and make new sequence. I hope you see here how these cells actually throw away mutated DNA. 
With the double strand break, you can get rid of all those intervening sequences and then use the DNA on the homologous chromosome to serve as template to make new sequence. Now I know it's confusing and it's hard to visualize. I appreciate that. So I have assigned a YouTube video, I've provided the link on Canvas, which shows homologous recombination in action. It's actually a homemade video, somebody did it with Play-Doh, but it is amazingly accurate and it shows this kind of in real time as it all works. And so I highly encourage you, actually I've made it required that you watch this video and I think it should uh, go a long way in helping you visualize and understand this process. It's also worth mentioning that you've probably heard of homologous recombination before. Not to give you nightmares tonight and bring up bad memories, but in genetics, certainly with me, if you had it with me last semester, but also if you've had it anywhere else or with anyone else, you should have talked quite extensively about the process of crossing over during meiosis. Crossing over occurs during prophase one of meiosis. It is the genetic swapping of material on two homologous chromosomes. So this shows crossing over occurring here during meiosis. And this is the swap of genetic information. Meiotic cells undergo crossing over, and the way that they do it is that they actually intentionally cut their own chromosomes, inducing their own double strand breaks on purpose. I mean, oh my god, I don't even want to think about that. It'd make you want to jump under the covers and hide your head. But that's what they do. They cut their own chromosomes in half and then rely on homologous recombination to repair those self-induced breaks. Why do, do, why do they do this? Well, they do this to accomplish crossing over. You might remember from genetics that the point of crossing over is to swap genetic material, DNA, between maternal and paternal chromosomes. This induces a much higher level of genetic diversity in the chromosomes that we pass on to the next generation than independent assortment alone. So the reason why there is so much variability in siblings and in families is because of crossing over. And crossing over is made possible through homologous recombination. Mechanistically, homologous recombination for crossing over is nearly identical to homologous recombination for repairing double strand breaks. So we'll end this lecture talking about mobile genetic elements. Now, if you want to talk about freaky stuff that's going to keep you from sleeping, this is the freakiest thing we'll talk about maybe in the whole course. Uh, when I think about mobile genetic elements, I actually get a little bit itchy, and I have to clear my mind and think about something else. This stuff is uh, no joke. The primary thing that's driving genetic change in our genome, in the human genome, and the primary thing that's responsible for human evolution is by far these mobile genetic elements. Mobile genetic elements alter the order of genes on our chromosomes, they alter the expression of genes causing us to make more or less or some or no protein, and they even have the capacity of introducing brand new genetic information into our genome. Mobile genetic elements actually and physically hop around in our genomes. They move from location to location and they do so completely unsupervised by any of our repair mechanisms in our cell. Mobile genetic elements are found in virtually all cells. They are very, very short and simple DNA sequences, but what makes them unique is this ability to move from one position on the genome to another. They can move in a single chromosome and jump from one place to another. They can move across chromosomes and jump into different sequences. Very simply put, this is what happens. You have one mobile genetic element in one DNA region, and it can replicate itself and hop into another region on another chromosome or another region on the same chromosome. And so you're left with the initial mobile genetic element that stayed where it was and a copy of it that jumped into this new sequence. Now please appreciate the fact that this is new foreign DNA that's been introduced in the middle of this genome, in the middle of this chromosome. So if this was an important gene up here, that gene's been disrupted and probably rendered inactive. If this was an important regulatory element that kept the gene off, that's been disrupted, and maybe now the gene is on. You're making a protein you shouldn't be making, or a protein you weren't making before. So having these DNA molecules kind of hop around on their own, unchecked, causes a great deal of physiological effects to the cell. Actually, the only restriction on these mobile genetic elements is that they can only hop around in a single cell. They can't leave one cell and go to another. Even that's not 
entirely true because a single cell with a mobile genetic element, if that cell replicates its genome and divides to two new cells, each of those new daughter cells will have the same mobile genetic elements that were present in the mother. So these mobile genetic elements can be transmitted generationally with cell division. They just can't leave one cell and hop into an unrelated cell and, and um, colonize that one. So if this reminds you of viruses, you're right. Viruses are mobile genetic elements. The only difference between viruses and what we're talking about here is viruses can leave one cell and infect another. We're not going to take the time to discuss viruses explicitly in this course, but for now, it should stand that viruses are little packets of DNA or RNA sequences that jump. They just jump from cell to cell. When a virus lands in one cell, it hijacks that cell's enzymes copies itself, bursts that host cell open, and then they jump to the next cell. So these are genetic elements, viruses are genetic elements that hop around. They just hop from cell to cell, killing cells as they go. Mobile genetic elements, what we're talking about here, are actually the long-lost ancestors of viruses. But mobile genetic elements have picked up so many mutations over the years that they can no longer leave a cell and infect another they're restricted to the cell that they landed in. They can do still a lot of the virus stuff that other viruses do, like hop around, copy themselves, colonize new DNA sequences. It's just that they're restricted to doing that in a single cell. Much like a virus, the mobile genetic element, this stretch of DNA that is capable of jumping, encodes on it all of the information for making the enzymes that are needed to trigger the jump. And so mobile genetic elements are self-contained, independent units that largely carry everything they need with them in sequence, in information, for mobilizing and jumping. Mobile genetic elements can also carry other genetic information. In fact, much of the widespread propagation of antibiotic resistance that we're seeing in a lot of bacteria now is due to mobile genetic elements that are being traded almost like information cards like like instruction manual pages from one bacterial cell to another now I told you mobile genetic elements can't leave cells well bacteria cells have a way of trading genetic information anyway uh, if you took genetics with me we talked about conjugation in bacteria Conjugation is when connections form between neighboring bacterial cells and DNA can be passed through those connections. These mobile genetic elements can pass through those connections as well. Mobile genetic elements are most commonly called transposons, and that's what we'll call them for the rest of this lecture. Transposons are called transposons because they transpose, they change their positions, they move. And there are two main mechanisms for transposition. The first is called non-replicative. Non-replicative transposition is really a cut-and-paste mechanism, and that's shown here on the left. The transposon is in the red. Its current position is this gray DNA, and it's going to move or jump, mobilize, to the orange DNA. Because it's non-replicative, we're not going to replicate the transposon. This physical sequence of DNA is going to literally cut itself out of this gray region and put itself into the orange region. So it's cut out and pasted in. No copying. And keep in mind, see here, that what's actually been left behind is a double-strand break. And so this double-strand break needs to be fixed, either by non-homologous end joining or homologous recombination. The other mechanism of transposition is replicative. The replicative mechanism is a copy-and-paste mechanism. Here, the original transposon is again present in the gray DNA sequence, but it is going to copy itself rather than move itself and it's going to copy a version of itself into the orange sequence. So when the transposition is over, we have a new transposon in the orange DNA, but the original transposon is also persisting as well, and so it has been replicated. Now, non-replicative and replicative transposons are DNA-only transposons. These are transposons that exist only in a DNA form. Human beings are loaded with transposons. Hold on to your socks, but the human genome is almost half transposons. About 50% of our entire genome is made up of these parasitic, jumping genes that do nothing for us at all directly and exist solely to propagate themselves. 
Some of the transposons we have are non-replicative. We have very few replicative transposons in us. Most of the human transposons are what are called retrotransposons, a third class of transposons. Retrotransposons are copied into RNA. They're actually transcribed, much like a protein coding gene would be. And then these RNA copies of the transposon DNA are reverse copied back to a DNA form. This is done by a specialized polymerase called a reverse transcriptase. Transcription is the process of going from DNA to RNA. Reverse transcription is going from RNA to DNA. So reverse transcriptases are DNA polymerases that use RNA as template. And so shown in this diagram, we have the initial, original retrotransposon existing in the DNA of the human being. This is transcribed into an RNA copy. That RNA copy encodes some proteins on it, and those proteins make a cut in a new spot that the transposon is going to be copied into. Once that cut is made, the RNA copy of the transposon is reverse transcribed back into double-stranded DNA, and that double-stranded DNA copy of the transposon jumps into the cut that was made. And so it is replicative in the sense that we have two copies now. The original transposon is left unchanged, and we have a new transposon in a new location. But since we went through an RNA intermediate, this is a retrotransposon. The gene encoding the reverse transcriptase is encoded on the transposon itself. So that re reverse transcriptase enzyme is translated from this RNA, much like we would translate any protein from RNA. Remember, I told you transposons are self-contained. They carry with them all the information they need to exist. They are self-contained little genetic units that have all they need to jump around. The most common human transposon is called the L1 element, or the line 1. Line actually stands for long interspersed element. So L1s are the most common human transposon. L1s, and L1s alone, account for about 15% of the human genome. And they just exist parasitically. Again, they alter our physiology in the sense that when they land, they cause changes. But they don't exist for our benefit in and of themselves. They are completely parasitic. Most L1s, or all L1s are retrotransposons. Most L1s have picked up enough of their own mutations that they've lost the ability to jump completely. They're no longer mobile. But some small percentage of L1s do still jump around in our genomes. In fact, about 40 years ago, there was an individual who developed hemophilia. Uh, hemophilia, of course, is the inability to have your blood clot. He had no family history of hemophilia at all. It was a spontaneous mutation. It was traced to an L1 that had jumped into a gene of his that was needed for a blood clotting factor. So this individual developed hemophilia due to the jumping of their lines, their L1 elements. The second most common human transposon is called the ALU element. The ALU element makes up another 10% of our genome. So ALUs and L1s alone make up a quarter of our entire genome. ALUs are also jumping retrotransposons. This is a very simple schematic to show how they jump, but an ALU element is copied into RNA, it is reverse transcribed, and then it jumps into a new novel sequence, disrupting whatever DNA it has landed in. Surprisingly, and interestingly, ALUs are unique to primates. So only humans and chimps and other primates have ALUs. There are no other species on Earth that ALUs have been found in. We have about one million distinct ALUs in our genome, and unlike the lines, many ALUs are still active, and they're still jumping around. So again, when you go to sleep tonight, just imagine all of these genetic elements, all these little pieces of DNA, popping out and copying and hopping into new sequences in all of your cells. Just amazing. ALUs do not encode their own reverse transcriptase. They actually need to mooch off of the reverse transcriptase that lines and other retrotransposons have made. And so ALUs rely on the enzymes that are made by other transposons to facilitate their jumping. But by altering gene expression, ALUs and lines probably make humans human. Now, grasp that for a moment. The differences in morphology, the differences in behavior between us and chimpanzees even, cannot be accounted for by the differences in our genetic sequences. We are much too similar in DNA sequence alone 
to chimpanzees to account for all of our morphological differences. So a question for a long time in evolutionary biology and evolutionary genetics is how can we be so different morphologically yet so the same in our DNA? The answer now points very strongly to the alus. Yes, our alus are similar in their sequence, but they're very different in their positions. And based on where these alus have jumped, based on the genes they have disrupted, the genes that they have helped, the proteins that are made as a result of alu jumping, and the proteins that aren't, that is what makes the differences between us and chimpanzees. The textbook says, and I think this is a wonderful quote, it is humbling to contemplate how many of our uniquely human qualities we might owe to these genetic parasites. It is entirely possible that we are who we are because of these parasitic jumping mobile elements. And I am not a religious person whatsoever, and I would never hope to influence your religious beliefs in any way. However, if you are looking to merge what you are seeing in your biology classes with your religious faith, if you are looking to see how God could affect the human species, if God's hand touches our genome, he touches it through alus. So what we talked about today is any permanent change in a DNA sequence is a mutation. That is the molecular definition of a mutation, a fixed change in DNA. A germline mutation is a mutation that occurs specifically in a gamete, typically has no effect on the mutant individual themselves, but they pass that mutation on to their next generation. And then that is the only DNA information that next generation has, and so every cell in that next generation individual contains the mutation. Somatic mutations are different. They occur in non-gametic cells. They result in a cluster of mutant cells, and the individual themselves experiences the effect of that somatic mutation. We talked about different types of mutations. Depurination is the loss of a base. The DNA backbone is left intact. Only the base is lost. This re results in an apurinic site. We also discussed deamination, which is the loss of an amino group from a DNA base. This typically results in a cytosine reverting to a uracil. Cell C uracil is thiamine, so deaminations could result in cytosine thiamine uh, mutations, base substitutions. DNA polymerase makes some mistakes, not many, but some, and those mistakes are fixed by a dedicated mechanism called DNA mismatch repair. DNA mismatch repair fixes the mistakes that sneak through DNA polymerase's proofreading ability, and we discussed DNA mismatch repair in some detail. We also went on to talk about base excision repair, which is where a single base is recognized as being mutant, it's cut out, and it's fixed. Nucleotide excision repair is kind of more of a brute force technique, where a large sequence of offending mutant DNA, single strand, is cut on either side of the mutation and removed in total, and then new sequence is put down. Because this is a brute force technique, it's been around for a very long time. It's very versatile, but it's also a little bit too brute force. It's conserved from humans to bacteria. Cells also experience double strand breaks, which could be very detrimental. All of the previous repair mechanisms rely on an unmutated strand of DNA to serve as a guide for fixing the mutant strand. Double strand breaks don't have that luxury. Double strand breaks have resulted in a complete severing of the DNA molecule and so we require alternate mechanisms for fixing this. The elegant and thorough mechanism is homologous recombination. We talked about strand invasion, we talked about uh, the D-loop and um, extending through the branch and all of that stuff to repair double strand breaks with homologous recombination. We also put it in the context of meiosis and crossing over. The quick and dirty technique for fixing double strand breaks is non-homologous recombination. This is where you just take both ends of broken DNA, file them down to be blunt, and glue them back together again. It works, fixes the double strand break, but it's also going to destroy any gene that might have been uh, included in that double strand break. We ended up talking about these mobile genetic elements, these transposons that basically jump around in our genomes unsupervised, going from one location to another. Some of them are non-replicative. These are the cut and paste transposons. The transposon itself leaves one location and moves to another. There are replicative transposons which copy themselves. So a new transposon is born and finds its way to a new location while the original transposon is unchanged. 
And then humans are just littered with these retrotransposons, which, which are transcribed into an RNA copy, then reverse transcribed back to DNA, and as a result are um, transposed into new locations, while the first transposon is left unchanged. And we talked about some of the implications on human evolution that these transposons uh, are certainly responsible for. So that's it for the Chapter 6 material now. In our next lecture, we'll be moving on to Chapter 7. And chapter 7 is going to be the last lecture we cover before our first exam. Chapter 7 is dedicated to the central dogma. We'll talk about, in our first lecture for Chapter 7, the process of transcription in some molecular detail. And then in the second half of Chapter 7, in our second lecture of that series, we will discuss translation, protein synthesis.